Good afternoon, NHK ANC members and friends. Welcome to this week's webinar on Bay Area Commercial Real Estate uh, Dynamics. I'm your host and also the event manager of NHK ANC, Yanni Lee. Uh, so today it is an honor to, um, to host Mr. Jay Sternberg, uh, Executive Vice President from the Colliers International. And today's webinar will be also moderated by our uh, board member, Ms. Uh, Angela Chen. She's also the president of the uh, Pillar Capital Group. So before we start today's webinar, there's a couple of things I would like to remind you. You are welcome to ask questions anytime during the webinar, and we were going to ask, answer your questions at the end of the webinar. Um, if you want to ask your questions, please utilize the Q&A boxes, which will be located on the toolbar. And if you have encountered any type of technical issues, please feel free to raise up your hands, and I will reach out to you. And at the end of the webinar, you'll be invited to a two-minute survey. Uh, if you have time, please uh, participate in the survey as it will help us to improve our future events. So um, that's all for today's, um, for today's information. And please join me in welcoming our pa uh, panelists today, Mr. Jay Sternberg and uh, Ms. Angela Chen. Uh, may you please go ahead, Angela? Thank you. Thank you, Jen uh, Yanni. So hi everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Angela Chong uh, with Pillar Capital Group and I'm also one of the board of directors uh, with uh, Hong Kong Association of Northern California. So um, hope everyone is staying safe and enjoying the uh, beautiful weather at the same time. And we are very happy and honored to have um, Mr. Jay Sternberg with Collier's uh, San Francisco joining us as our speaker today. And Jay is, uh, has been with uh, Collier's International San Francisco since 2002. And he also is the founding partner of Occupier Services Bay Area in San Francisco. In addition to being Collier's San Francisco number one producer in 2010, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, Jay is as also a top 10 producer each year from 2006 to 2019 and was recognized by the San Francisco T Business Times for the 2010 Best Office Lease in San Francisco. And um, Jay is a San Francisco native and has grown up in a family deeply involved in the Bay Area San Francisco uh, real estate industry. So today he will um, go over uh, with us um, some of our local commercial real estate market overview, including like historical analysis and trends, and also how COVID-19 impacts our commercial real estate market. So let's welcome Jay and uh, I'll pass it on to you to take over from here, Jay. Thanks, Yanni and Angela. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to make sure that you are able to see my screen. Angela, can you guys see it? Give me a nod or a yes. Uh, yes. Yes, I can see it. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, thanks for having me. Um, as Angela mentioned, we're going to talk about San Francisco market today and an overview and what we're seeing. Uh, we'll start general and we'll talk about San Francisco and then we'll also start talking about COVID and uh, some of the impacts we're seeing specifically in San Francisco and in the greater Bay Area. Um, quick overview on, on who I am and, and what we do. Um, I lead a team of uh, 35 people in the Bay Area uh, between San Francisco, the Peninsula, East Bay and Silicon Valley. Uh, we specialize and focus 100% of our work in occupier services. So. Um, we represent a lot of uh, the brand name companies in the Bay Area, ranges from early stage bootstrap startup companies, um, all the way up to mature private public companies, mid cap and, and some of the largest companies in the world. Um, so I'm speaking to you from um, uh, a position of involvement with, with a number of these companies that, that drive the Bay Area real estate, um, that are innovators in the world, uh, it's tech, it's the innovation capital of the world. Uh, and so we're right here in the middle of everything and we get a pretty good perspective as a result of that. Um, the dynamics in the market are largely created by the larger users. Um, the early stage guys aren't driving the market, it's your Fortune 500 folks. 
uh, that are typically driving the market and then create the environment that everybody else has to live in and navigate. Um, some of our larger clients that we represent are kind of uh, have, have a more uh, international scope, uh, national and international scope. So we do venture uh, outside the Bay Area quite a bit and get a little bit of a global perspective. With that said, our core expertise, our backyard is San Francisco and the Bay Area. Uh, and that's where the majority of our discussions are going to um, uh, uh, address today. Um, in terms of what we do, um, I mentioned we're global uh, from you know, we average anywhere from 250 to 400 transactions a year. Um, last year, it was 94 of those in San Francisco, 143 outside of San Francisco, but in the Bay Area, 87 across the U.S., and then another 77 internationally, uh, and just under 9 million square feet. Um, in terms of, of what we're talking about today and what we're dealing with uh, at San Francisco, when you take a step back, and look at San Francisco, there's a number of things that have happened over time that shape uh, the environment that we have. Um, whether it was service trains connecting BART and beginning service to San Francisco and really opening up the East Bay with public transit, whether it was Prop M being acted in 1986 that put a limitation on new office development in San Francisco, or whether it's something completely out of our control entirely like the 1989 earthquake that, uh, that demolished the uh, the Embarcadero Freeway, and ultimately led to the, the building of Pac Bell, Hills Plaza renovations, et cetera. We had a natural event, natural disaster event that uh, created and spurred a wave of development throughout San Francisco. Um, uh, we had the dot-com boom and bust. Um, fast forward, financial crisis of 2000, 2008 and 2009, which was largely driven by fractures in the capital markets, uh, which is much different than we're seeing this time around. And here we are, uh, present day, talking today about COVID and the impact on the market. Um, this one's an interesting one, and it's still present, pre it's still present day, uh, so we're still learning a lot about it. And, and what's interesting is this is uh, partially uh, out of our control and partially self-inflicted. Um, we obviously didn't create the virus and spread a virus and have a global pandemic, but we did create a recession by, by forcing a shutdown, sending, sending everyone home and effectively stopping commerce. Um, so as we move into the future, um, we're all wondering what COVID-19 is gonna mean long-term. Um, we're starting to live with the short-term impacts and trying to process, internalize, and uh, hypothesize about where we think things are going. And presumably that's why many people are attending the call today. Um, generally as it relates to San Francisco. Um, the price of doing business in San Francisco is extreme. Um, that's not going away. Most cities out there where a lot of our Bay Area clients go and are looking to distribute workforces and get employees out of the Bay Area, whether it's for um, cost of living reasons, uh, it's really access to talent. They're all chasing talent. Um, talent in the Bay Area is expensive. Uh, can you find talent in other markets? Uh, a lot of these markets provide tax incentives to go there. Uh, they're welcoming tenants. They're, they're recruiting businesses to come. That is not the San Francisco MO. Uh, San Francisco will tax you to be here. They have continued to find ways to tax businesses. Um, they continue to look for ways to uh, tax businesses. And uh, we don't see that thing, we don't see that changing anytime soon. Gross receipt tax 2018 was 0.3%. Uh, we're now 3.5% plus. Uh, you try to translate that to a lease, it's not perfect math because everyone's comp structure is different, lease rates are different, et cetera. But generally, you want to underwrite a number, you can add that to $3 a square foot to your rental rate as a result of a, a gross receipt tax. Um, they're coming after. You're going to see some stuff on the no, November 2020 ballot measures, uh, the increase in transfer tax. So when a building trades hands, uh, they're looking to, to tax that at a higher rate than previously. Uh, Prop 13 is looking like it's gonna be on the ballot uh, in November. And is that gonna get revisited for commercial properties? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but uh, I think the general takeaway is, uh, San Francisco is an incredibly expensive place to do business. We don't see that changing as a result of, of COVID. Uh, the city um, will continue to tax the businesses that choose to operate there. Um, this is just a simple graph that kind of looks at uh, cost of living. Uh, the Bay Area is not, um, the, Bay Area, 
<laughs> Nobody in the Bay Area is exempt from this list. San Francisco leads it. New York's the only other one that gets up there with the Bay Area. Um, San Jose, Oakland, and San Francisco take three of the top four spots in terms of uh, your cost of living index. Um, we like to show this map here. Uh, we call it our San Francisco market dynamics map. Uh, and it's a little busy. Um, and the reason we do this and we put this on there is each one of these dots has a story. Um, it might be a transaction that occurred or didn't occur, uh, someone moving to the area, someone moving out of the area. But generally, what I, what I was saying at the outset is the big companies, the headliners, um, Facebook, Salesforce, Microsoft, uh, Google, um, Apple, these are the companies that we read about in the headlines. These are the guys with the deep pockets. Um, I've heard a local developer uh, characterize a large portion of our tenant base as, as, as relatively rent agnostic, uh, which is somewhat funny and somewhat true um, because these companies can afford to pay rent. And uh, whether rent is $80 a foot, $82 a foot, $90 a foot, $100 a foot, or $60 a, a square foot, that's not gonna impact these companies' ability to be in business, to make money, uh, to, to have huge revenue, to be profitable. It does impact the service industries and everyone else, but that's not what the market drafts off of. The market drafts off of, drafts off of your large tenants, your, 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 your higher rents. Um, these larger, uh, larger kind of blue chip companies have been gravitating towards larger blocks of space, uh, which there's been an incredible shortage of large blocks of space in San Francisco. Uh, newer construction, higher end construction. And so we've constantly seen an increase in rental rates over time as a result of the behavior of your large companies that you read about in the paper. And what that creates is an environment that the rest of us will have to figure out how to navigate and live in. Um, this is a fun one to go through when you start going through them piece by piece and why are they on here. Um, if we started getting bogged down on this map, we wouldn't make it too far through the presentation. Uh, but I wanted to showcase this because it, it, it helps to highlight uh, the amount of activity and the types of firms that are doing significant transactions and making headlines in San Francisco. Um, this is a little bit of a drill down in the South Financial District. It's been one of the most active submarkets that we've had over the last couple years. Um, and it's really where uh, the who's who of, of tech has, has, has really um, centered congregated around you have Google that's developed somewhat of a waterfront um, somewhat of a waterfront uh, campus uh, you have Facebook come in and you know they had zero square feet in San Francisco six months later they had over 1.3 million square feet under lease historically San Francisco hasn't seen that type of leasing we haven't had those type of commitments from companies and over the last decade San Francisco became a place that people wanted not only wanted to have an outpost but even potentially headquartered historically the the, the companies that headquartered in San Francisco, Schwab, uh, Wells Fargo, your banking companies, those guys are all fleeing San Francisco. They're all downsizing, moving jobs elsewhere. Uh, we, can, we expect to see that trend to continue simply because of the cost of living. Your banks operate on, on, on thinner margins, smaller margins than your tech companies. They're going to look harder for that arbitrage. They're going to look to move uh, jobs, any jobs they can out of the Bay Area. Um, Salesforce, another interesting one, has congregated and built an urban campus in this area. Um, and we've seen a lot of development here. Um, and it's really probably, I would argue, the most dynamic area of San Francisco literally over the last five years, just by virtue of, of the folks that are doing business here. Um, this is a chart that we like to look at um, to kind of talk about where San Francisco's been and where we are. Um, going back to 1980, um, your yellow line here is your average class A rental rates. Um, if I showed you class B rents and rents by submarket for the most part, uh, they're going to they're gonna correlate with the class A rents. Class A rents are a pretty good uh, benchmark for, for the overall market. Your blue line here is your average sale price per square foot. Uh, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that we are at record highs for rents and class A uh, or sales prices per square foot in San Francisco. Um, and what you'll see in your new supply in these gray lines down here is uh, the new supply coming online from our developer and ownership communities. Um, typically, you'll see these rents start going up and then you see the product come to follow. Uh, it's no exception. We've seen a wave of development and what's started to limit us now is is frankly the Prop M. 
and, and has slowed that down. Uh, we've also have a, a bunch of pent up development coming in Central Soma. Uh, it's starting to get approved and we're starting to see that break through. And so we'll start seeing some more projects come online. Uh, for the most part, uh, those that can go are still going. Um, even on a spec basis, Tishman Spire and the Giants down at Mission Rock um, are, are building a, a building for Visa. They're going to go spec on, on their second building. And then they're also going to go spec on their 598 Brandon project. Uh, Kilroy's got the Flower Mart. Um, they're still full speed ahead, but they're years away from actually being shovel ready because they need to relocate the existing flower mart and um, get them up and out of there before they can even start thinking about demo and getting shovel ready. So they have the luxury of awaiting a couple years. Um, Boston Properties has pulled back and probably not gonna go spec on their site there and have pulled out of, uh, have slowed some development down in, in San Jose as well. So um, we're keeping a close eye on, on what those developers are gonna do. I think each of them have their own risk tolerance levels and own, uh, portfolio uh, concerns or the balance of their portfolio that they're going to um, also evaluate in the context of what capital to put at risk and when to do it. Um, but generally, um, we're still in an ele elevated rent environment. Um, and um, this dip right here looks a little bit exaggerated. Um, uh, if you look at rents kind of flat year over year, um, we're really uh, pretty much flat from Q1 2019 to Q1 2020. We saw a little bit of a spike towards the end of 2019. Um, we try to stay away from looking at, at, at analysis on a quarter to quarter basis. Um, a quarter doesn't make a market. Um, two quarters don't make a market. You start seeing trends over a year, two year period. Um, and I think it's safe to say, you look back to 2010 um, and we're up over 200% from where rents were in 2010. Um, so uh, where are we going? Um, we'll talk a little bit about We'll talk a little bit more about that as we proceed, but uh, this just goes to show, uh, these, these two graphs show how volatile of a market San Francisco is. Um, I would argue we probably go up too fast and that results in us coming down too fast. Um, but we're a volatile market, uh, not always supply and demand driven. 2007 felt a little bit artificial uh, with the capital markets. Uh, but, you know, we've got a robust marketplace in San Francisco, sub 5% vacancy before COVID hit. Um, that led to this spike in rents. We had an insatiable appetite of space from your big tech companies that uh, were relatively rent agnostic, as I said, construction pricing through the roof. Um, and so if you're going to, if a developer is going to make a project pencil and get a, a buildable return, um, they need to achieve these high rents just as a result of the cost of their land and their cost of construction. And so it's all part of the same ecosystem. Um, the part of the ecosystem right now that's a little bit concerning is the demand side, and we'll talk more about that as well. In terms of, uh, in terms of uh, total office sales volume, this will be an interesting one to watch. Uh, this is kind of a historic look. Um, average, we're doing about $3.2 billion. Um, but uh, last year boomed, and you can see your average price per, per square foot is your lower number. Uh, the number of transactions is your, uh, your, your upper number. Um, and in Q1 2020, uh, we were off to a, a decent start here and looking like we were gonna uh, hold pricing and hold in line with historical averages, uh, and then COVID hit. So when you take a deeper dive on what deals happened, what trades did happen, um, these are all pre-COVID. Uh, the only one that started flirting with it a little bit uh, was the Salesforce deal at 450, 440, 450 Mission Street. Um, this is a strategic transaction. Salesforce has owns the building uh, at 50 Fremont next door. They have the lease at 350 Mission across the street, and they have just under a million square feet at Salesforce Tower. Um, Oceanwide Center, which is uh, kind of on the other side of this uh, project, um, has hit some challenges there. The feasibility of that project is in question right now. Um, Salesforce was prepared to lease the entirety of that office space, but that project is a mixed-use development that has a, a hotel and a, a, a residential component to it uh, that's now potentially being revisited. And uh, as a result, uh, we'll see if that project does get built. Um, I think, if you ask me, I wasn't involved in the Salesforce transaction. I don't represent them. 
but my take on this is uh, Salesforce's behavior over the last several years has had a keen interest on uh, uh, growth potential over the long term. Um, at the same time, they're going and leasing Parcel F, which is on the uh, Transbay Terminal, uh, an unapproved project uh, that they went and signed a lease on. They were trying to lease Oceanwide Power, and at the same time, they were subleasing space in the 53 Mott building that they own. Um, that means they're long on short space and short on long space. And so they're a hyper growth company. Uh, they're a San Francisco headquartered company. They plan to be in San Francisco for the long term. And so this deal signifies to me it's a long term control play. This is something that we would look to uh, see them develop probably in the next seven to 15 years. This is not something, a skyscraper that we're going to see in the next year or two or three. Um, the, the San Francisco, the catalyst to our engine, um, we feel is our VC dollars. We pay close attention to the money uh, that's flowing into the system, that's keeping the ecosystem moving. Uh, if you figure tax our engine, uh, the gas for that engine is the VC dollars. Um, Q1, uh, strong. Uh, COVID was not here yet. All eyes on Q2, Q3, and Q4. Um, what we're seeing is uh, three quarters in a row of consecutive quarters of number of deal decline. Uh, we're still holding at kind of um, total investment dollars where we want to see them. Um, we're really interested to see what the data comes out at, at the end of Q2. Um, again, we're in the middle of this. Um, it feels like everyone got real frozen for a month or two, but we're starting to see some funding come out. Uh, it seemed to start to loosen up a little bit, but this is a good indicator to watch uh, for, for on the real estate side as well. If the new companies aren't being funded, if there's not an M&A market out there, if there's not the ability to exit for these companies and for the VCs investing in these companies, that's where we start having some real exposure. Um, but as long as the market stays hot or uh, stays recovered, <laughs> provides exit potential for companies, we're going to be okay. We love this graph. Um, people often ask us what's going to happen with rents in the future. And we joke around, um, if you can predict the stock market, we can predict office rents. Um, historically, uh, Class A rents in San Francisco versus the NASDAQ are almost perfectly correlated, uh, but with a delay. Um, you know, historically, those delays were a little bit longer. My personal opinion is there will, there will always be a delay, but that delay period will shorten just as technology and information flows uh, more freely. Um, it doesn't take as long to learn about information today as it did 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And so I don't think that the, the compression, I think the time will compress and you'll see tighter correlation. Um, and so here we are. This is the big question mark. This is the debate we're having daily. Um, we watched the NASDAQ fall 30% over the course of a couple weeks. Um, we've now seen the NASDAQ almost recover to where we were uh, uh, at our previous high on February 19th. Um, so um, what does this mean for rental rates? Um, we'll see. There's massive uncertainty out there. Transactions have frozen. We're still in that frozen environment, certainly in San Francisco. Um, and that's pretty much echoed for most of the major cities where we're doing business. Um, the repricing of real estate. Everybody is very interested in the, the changing pricing and the changing dynamics and real estate doesn't work like that. Um, we've run a number of surveys over the last couple weeks, several weeks for clients, um, whether it's trying to comp out sublease space we're bringing to market or whether it's for the very few requirements on the demand side that we have at the moment. Um, we haven't noticed a big move in asking rents uh, from the developers. We don't expect the development community, the ownership community to be in a huge hurry to change their rents. This graph, this type of thought process certainly would uh, lean towards your developers holding to wait and see what happens as best they can. Um, the people that don't think like that are your tenants and your corporates. Uh, Corporates don't care about the, the data point in their building. They don't care about the capitalized value of their owner's asset. They are looking at expense recovery, um, cost mitigation, whatever they can do. And so we've seen over a million square feet of subway space at the market since the 
uh, shelter in place uh, came to place, came in place. Um, we've seen uh, some of those come on the market at lofty asking rents. We've seen some of those come on the market at aggressive asking rents, um, trying to get trying to get any activity they can. Um, the biggest issue right now is not the supply side, it's the demand side. There's very few actual uh, real transactions out there right now to be had. And as a result of that, we don't have many data points. I think you look at the ownership community, uh, your institutional owners, uh, your, the capital markets environment, your debt and equity folks, everybody wants a marketplace. Everybody wants to know where the market is. We're just in this period where you don't have the data points to be able to go underwrite the deal. And so it, it creates this, this paralysis where deals don't happen. Um, everybody's waiting for the market to start to evolve so that we can start having transactions again, whatever that market might be. Um, um, corporates that are in triage mode have conducted layoffs, have excess space that are putting it on the market. Um, they've got different motivations, as I said before. And so that's where we're starting to see some movement. Um, we have a, a smaller client, um, about 10,000 square feet. So figure about a full floor in, in your smaller floor plate buildings or a half a floor in your larger floor plate buildings. They need to be in a space right now. And, um, they're a good credit user. Um, and they're focused on, on watching dollars and we went around and they were, they were looking at subleases and we, we saw the gamut. We saw uh, uh, sub lessors trying to hold the line on asking rents pre COVID. And then we saw other folks, uh, competing to come meet a market that we don't know where it is. And we sent out some very, very aggressive proposals and um, are striking terms um, at a rent that I haven't seen in, in, in over five years, um, what on sublease or direct space at all. And so we are starting to see some of those opportunities exist um, on the sublease basis. Um, and subleases come with all kinds of risks and problems. And there's, for as many reasons there are to do them, there's equal, as many reasons not to do them. Um, and it's kind of a case by case basis, but your corporates are gonna drive the rents down to the extent we're gonna see uh, significant downward pressure on rents. It's gonna be led by corporates. And once we start to have a marketplace that's developed uh, uh, and, and real data points we can point to, we'll start to see the market transacting again. Uh, nobody wants to catch a falling knife. Nobody wants to race the market down. Um, and so, uh, this one's an interesting one. I can't sit here and explain to you why the stock market is where it is. You know, if we go back to the beginning of the year and you said, and you told me, said, hey, um, we're going to have a, 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 a oil go negative, a global pandemic, we're going to shut down our economy for three months, and then we're going to have civil unrest in the United States, and our stock market's going to brush it off like nothing happened, I would tell you you're crazy. Uh, but here we are. Um, I'm not an economist, I'm a real estate agent. And um, what we look at are, we, we look for trends, we look for um, things we can point to to try to help us figure out where things are going. Um, and to date, this is the single-handed best graph that we have to do that. Um, indicators I pointed to before, I think watch your VC activity and then watch your leasing volume. If leasing volume really drops off from our, call it 9 million square foot per year average, of typical leasing in San Francisco, if that number drops to two, three, or four million, um, that's a pretty good sign that, that uh, uh, the marketplace has slowed considerably and we're likely to see a, a, a rents, rents moving down. Um, I mentioned the development pipeline. A lot of stuff that's in the pipeline right now getting built has been pre-leased. Um, the stuff that's under construction and getting um, delivered soon, this is the only stuff that's actually uh, likely going to be, well, the ocean wide I mentioned, we'll see if that, that ultimately gets built. They're, they're under construction, uh, officially under construction. The, the viability of that project is a question at the moment, um, certainly at the current pricing. But uh, 5M is a development that they're gonna be the one that came on, comes online here and, and really gonna have to test the market. They had really solid activity uh, going into pre-COVID. Most of that activity has gone dormant uh, post-COVID. Um, we've seen a bunch of uh, corporate sublease space come on the market. Macy's.com put 250,000 square feet on the market. Jewel vacating 123 Mission puts three quarters of a building in play. Uh, Subhub massive layoffs. There's a couple hundred thousand feet in play in 199 three months. So all of a sudden, 
you know, six months ago where we didn't have line of sight on a big block of space. If you were a large company, one of the headline companies that people write about and do the deals that people write about, um, if you were looking for space, you had very few options and you were planning out for 2024, 2025. What I can tell you from the conversations we have with our Fortune 500, Fortune 100 clients is it's, it's mostly pencils down. Um, Nobody is in a real hurry to make a, a, a highly strategic decision right now. Um, it's very much a wait and see. Uh, if you go put a, a lease in front of a CFO and it's a $100 million commit or a $400 million commit or whatever it might be, the question that they're going to ask is, do I have to sign this right now? And what if I don't? And uh, for the most part, the what if I don't is it's not going to go get leased to somebody else because nobody's really in that aggressive uh, let's go take down any space we can mindset that we saw that was pretty prevalent and pervasive over the last several years, this whole run up, frankly. Um, Google's been on a binge. Apple's been on a binge. I'm going to show a couple slides later that kind of are a good microcosm for what's, what's happened to the Bay Area over the last, the last 10 years, last 15, 20 years. Um, but what we're seeing right now, approved projects, um, that are going to go. Uh, I mentioned 598 Brandon, Brandon Square, they're going to go. Uh, Flower Mart is still at least going through the motions because they need to get the other group out. Uh, Boston Properties site, I don't think they'll go spec right now. Um, we'll see what changes. Uh, One Vassar, they've got their approval. It's a three building site, a hotel, a residential site, and an office site. Uh, they're just going out looking for representation in the market. I don't think they're going to go spec um, right now. And, and if they were going to go on anything, it would be the office building and uh, we'll see what happens there. Obviously the pre-let properties, uh, those are blown and going. Those are already leased. They're going to get delivered. Um, when you take a look at, at who the players are in San Francisco uh, that we deal with, um, these are the folks that own property. Um, two called out in red here, uh, WeWork and, uh, and uh, NoTel. There's been a lot of discussions about the flex office space and the viability of these organizations. We work with 40 plus billion valuations. You know, SoftBank wrote that down uh, in their portfolio at a $2.9 billion, billion valuation. Um, They're talking to most of their landlords about rent concessions, not paying rent, renegotiating leases, uh, putting keys back. Both WeWork and NoTel, for the most part, sign their leases as single purpose entities. Um, and so they can really address these situations on a case by case basis. We expect them to treat it very similar to a retail model. <clears throat> you keep your profitable sites, you dump your, co your, cost, uh, your, your cost heavy sites, and anything that's on the margin, you're going to go look to renegotiate to see if you can get it positive uh, or make it an asset, make it something you want to keep. Um, no tells the other interesting one to watch. They've, they've failed to make several rent payments and, and we'll see what happens. But, uh, this is the landscape of your, your San Francisco, uh, landlords, uh, just to kind of show you the impact we work had in our marketplace. This is their footprint in San Francisco. Um, and there's quite a bit of exposure here. Um, if you think about WeWork's business model, um, they have an enterprise model trying to compete with your your ownership, your, your large institutional owners, if you will. Um, and then they have the membership model, which is, you know, anybody can go have a membership and go in. Well, the problem with the membership model is anybody can cancel that on 30 days notice. So, uh, and it's also based on a high density environment. They offer, you know, 55 rentable square feet per person. That's not six feet of separation. That doesn't adhere to social distancing. That doesn't adhere to any of the stuff that we're having to deal with right now as a result of COVID and the pandemic. Um, and so we expect uh, there to be a lot of issues there. Um, it's, it's obviously reflected in, in, the, in the valuations, um, uh, write downs that they've experienced there. Uh, same case with NoTel. Um, I wonder if NoTel is going to come out of this alive. Um, we've had instances where we have clients in their space, our clients paying them rent. They're not paying the landlord rent. Um, it's a whole disaster of a situation you then have to engage and deal with. And so um, all eyes on that one as well. Um, getting out of San Francisco specifically and a little bit wider of a Bay Area look, 
Uh, this is your office, uh, your vacancy rates, uh, and your rentable square foot and your available square footage on a, on a more macro Bay Area basis. Um, I won't dive too much into this, but the common themes are your higher rents are going to be um, on the, uh, the San Francisco to San Jose corridor, your 101 and, and 280 uh, through the peninsula and down to the valley. And you're going to see lower rates as you move up uh, through the East Bay. Um, I mentioned the Google Apple effect. I think these, these, this series of graphs is probably uh, the best depiction of what's happened in, in the Bay Area and Bay Area real estate um, over the past several years. Um, so you look back in, in 2000 um, and, uh, and uh, we had uh, Apple that had 92,000 square feet in Cupertino in a couple buildings and Google had 42,000 feet um, over in, in uh, uh, Shoreline near the amphitheater for, for one of their first sites. You fast forward five years, these companies started to grow. Apple had expanded their presence to 1.3 million square feet. Google almost got to a million square feet by 2005. By 2010, uh, the sprawl continued. Apple's up to 6.4 million square feet and Google to two point, almost two and a half million square feet. Um, and then the surge really started. It, it felt like we got through 2010 um, and then we started to pick up a tail when tech started to come back. Um, Twitter showed up and became a real company. Uh, Zynga came out of a potato chip factory um, and to end up going public and hiring over 3,000 people and, and uh, doing a big lease in a building and ultimately buying that building. Um, Twitter and Zynga, two tech companies headquartered in San Francisco. Salesforce continuing their growth, headquartered in San Francisco. So that was kind of the first um, Let's, we're seeing tech companies headquartered in San Francisco. We're starting to see uh, larger transactions happen in San Francisco. Um, and that was not something we saw a lot of uh, pre-2010. Fast forward to 2015, the sprawl really starts going. Apple, 13 million square feet. Google, 10 million square feet. And then you come to 2019 and Google's up to almost 25 million square feet and Apple's at 16 and a half million square feet. So, um, what, this ha what, what happens when you have this, and it goes back to the market dynamics map I was talking about. Google can afford to pay rent, whether it's a dollar a foot, $3 a foot, or $5 a foot. They can afford to pay that. Same with Apple. They flex their muscle and have pushed people out of Mountain View. They've driven rents up in Mountain View. It's hard to be a business in Mountain View right now, and you're going to be competing with Google. Same thing with Apple and Cupertino. Apple crept into Sunnyvale and, and on the Sunnyvale border as well. And now we're seeing Google and Apple go into San Jose. And so um, watching these companies is, is very interesting. They've had a massive impact on the market. I think one of the most overlooked headlines over the last couple months was Google slowing their pace of play and their uh, curbing their insatiable appetite for space. Um, you know, they pulled out of the Pier 70 deal in San Francisco. Uh, they've slowed their, uh, their takedown of space and um, we'll see what happens. We haven't seen layoffs from any of these large companies. Tech has largely avoided the layoffs, which is great. Um, it's saving our Bay Area marketplace, um, frankly. Um, um, not everyone's avoided the layoffs, but we have, we have, we have seen tech generally uh, do better than, than most. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, so what does this all mean? What's COVID's impact on the market? Um, for us, it's really been, uh, people want information. Um, we have been uh, as busy um, um, working with clients, dealing with clients over the past few months as we've ever been. Um, and we've completed virtually no transactions. Uh, people want information. People need to talk about their situation. Um, I have this problem or here's what's going on and we're having to engage and uh, some of it's legitimate, some of it's not. We've had clients ask us, do I have to pay rent? We had a publicly traded company that we represent come to us and, and ask us about paying rent and we told them, um, we've read your leases, we don't see anything in your lease that uh, allows you to not pay rent. Um, and uh, they wanted to take COVID as an opportunity or as a, as a situation to try to be opportunistic. And so they stopped paying rent to their landlords pretty much across the board. 
Um, that was not received well, as you can imagine. Um, the landlords didn't have to look any further than our publicly available financials to see $500 million in cash on the balance sheet and wondering why we were unable to pay our rent commitments. Um, and so what happens is you start getting default notices, et cetera. You lose expansion rights, renewal options as a result of doing those things. All those things we work very hard to negotiate into a lease go away when you are in default. Um, so it didn't take long for them to, uh, to cure and, 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 and pay up um, and, and um, get current on rent. Uh, but we're seeing all different companies approach it all different ways. Um, I, I'm gonna shave. I, 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 didn't, I, I stopped shaving when the SIP started. I will shave when I close my first deal. But as I sit here with you today, two and a half plus months later, I have not closed a deal since COVID started. So therefore I have not shaved yet. I'm looking forward to shaving soon, hopefully. Um, but the market pulse, our clients have asked for more information. Typically we've reported um, information quarterly um, and we've started to do it uh, more frequently every couple weeks, just based on what we're seeing. Um, you can see our projections. We expect rents to go down, uh, primarily led by the sublease market. We've seen over a million square feet uh, hit the market since it started. Um, um, we talked about the layoffs. I mentioned the layoffs here. This is just one to look at. Uber, over 6,700 people. They've already put their Pier 70 space on the market. They're long three buildings on Market Street that they already plan to roll out of as they consolidate down at their new headquarters in Mission Bay with the Warriors. Um, so that's other large blocks of space that are in play. Airbnb had big layoffs, Yelp, Lyft, uh, Jewel. Um, um, so we've seen layoffs. It is impacting our marketplace, um, but it hasn't been as drastic as it could be. Um, and so we are fortunate of that. Um, um, if you look kind of more macro, where the dollars are going in commercial real estate investment, this is not Bay Area. This is uh, more macro and national outlook, uh, but you look at your year over year um, changes, and this is for the month of April. Uh, office was down 60% year over year, makes sense. Retail investment um, down 84%. Uh, the hotel one is the one that jumps off the page. The hotel market's virtually dead. Um, zero transactions, zero, zero investment dollars going into hotel deals in the month of April. Um, you know, industrial is the top performer right now. Um, and we'll see what we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. We're really interested to see how the May data comes in on this. Um, we expect it to, to, to kind of hold the line here. Um, industrial probably outperforming the rest of the markets and hopefully apartments too. Uh, the hotel market's pretty, um, um, in a lot of trouble and, and retail as well with, with, um, a lot of the small business and a lot of the impact that SIP had is SIP has had on the retail. Um, environment. This is a bar Jeff depicting uh, basically the same information, uh, but you can see investment dollars April this year compared to April last year. It's not a surprise. It's just kind of reinforcing what we all uh, thought was the case. Um, labor and employment. Um, I mentioned the layoffs. Uh, <laughs> national unemployment up over 20%. Uh, San Francisco 10%. Um, over 5.6 million people have filed since May 11th, uh, 38 million people since March 16th, which is what we're using for the start of SIP for, for, our, for our analysis. Um, and we'll see what happens. It's put all eyes on, on layoffs and how these companies do. The other thing that's getting a lot of, uh, excuse me, the other thing that's getting a lot of discussion right now, we're spending a lot of time talking about it. And frankly, where the tenants and users are focused is on the future of the workplace. Um, so instead of worrying about signing my lease for my next building, company leaderships and executives are worrying about how are we gonna take care of our workforce? How are we gonna get, <coughs> how are we gonna get our people back into the office safely? And what's our business gonna look like in the future? Um, nobody's in a huge rush to spend big time dollars on this. Nobody's made the call on what it's gonna look like. The most interesting situations we're dealing with with our clients are the ones that are that are forced to do something right now. Like we signed a lease pre-COVID, landlords doing base building work. We're getting five floors turned over to us March 1st. We were getting ready to go build them out. And all of a sudden, we're pressing the pause button and looking at how we're going to build those out. It's going to be different. Um, right now, the, the, the specific client I'm talking about 
has taken the approach that we're going to build out one floor, uh, kind of in line with how we did it before. We don't have many people in the workforce going back, but it's going to allow us to get out of our old lease. We'll build out a floor, and we're going to take a much more methodical wait and see approach on the other four floors uh, to, to try to ultimately build what we think is going to be the workplace of the future. So all effort on getting back to work and figuring out what the future is going to be, not a whole lot of people willing to put the uh, you know, drive the stake in the ground and spend those investment dollars right now. Um, things outside of the workplace, how are people going to get to work? Um, what are people going to do before and after work? We're in San Francisco in a vertical market. How are you going to get people up and down a building? Um, social distancing, you can get exactly one person in an elevator, which makes your vertical buildings functionally obsolete for the most part. Um, so we've got a long way to go before we get back to normal. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how, how various folks approach that. Um, I mentioned the lease issues. Do we need to pay rent? Uh, force majeure um, has been something that's been talked about. That's not really applicable for whether you have to pay rent or not. It does come into play if you're in a build out or in a construction period. If, a, if you have a, a big owner who's building a building for you, their construction likely got delayed. They're issuing force majeure notices to extend their delivery deadlines. Vice versa, tenants that have are doing TI build outs that have been impacted or sending force majeures to their owners, extending their build out period to the extent they appropriately negotiated that stuff in their leases. Um, and then the last thing, I think all eyes on construction. Um, is there going to be a decrease in demand as a result of this? Is there going to be an increase in demand because people are going to have to reimagine their workplace and make a bunch of changes to it? Um, is the OSHA requirements and the social distancing going to require longer project schedules, which increase labor costs. Um, there's very real potential of that. Um, this is just a quick slide on kind of a case study of different types of projects and what it costs to build out space over the last couple of years. Um, we saw costs, construction costs rise, you know, above 35% between 2018, 2019. Some case studies of different types of companies, cost per square foot on what they're building out. Um, and we'll have to see. I mentioned it, uh, lack of manpower, unions negotiating in this environment, higher rates because of hazard pay. Um, you know, are we gonna see a dip in con overall construction? Maybe people get hungry. It's just too soon to tell, we don't know yet. Um, and we haven't had enough uh, use cases to really, to really have the data to support it. Um, I'll skip over this. With that said, um, I want to open it up. I know there's some, some questions coming in. I wanted to leave some time to answer those. Um, so yeah. I will answer these coming in. Do you see residential market in SF area will get affected by commercial real estate? Um, that's an interesting one. Um, I don't think commercial real estate itself impacts your SF Bay Area uh, residential markets. Um, I think it goes back to really more the labor component of it. If these tech companies like Jack Dorsey came out and said that Twitter, his two companies, Twitter and Square, that they are not ever going to require their employees to uh, come back to the office. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not going to have office space and they're not going to allow employees to come back. It means they're not going to require their employees to come back. We have already seen, or we're seeing a transition start. People are trying to give employees choice, trying to give them flexibility, uh, dynamic work or distributed work or a couple buzzwords we've seen. Um, and your more cutting edge companies have invested in technology to allow them to support a distributed workforce and trying to drive those workers into other markets where they can go get talent in other markets. So get it out of San Francisco and the Bay Area. High cost of real estate, high cost of labor. If they can go hire someone in Bend, Oregon and pay them 70% of what they can in the Bay Area, companies pick up that arbitrage. And if they can do that without losing productivity, it's a no brainer. So we were starting to see this stuff happen. What COVID really did was uh, force, force the acceleration of that conversation and test it out. You ask executives six months ago, hey, why don't you send everyone home and see what happens? That was a pretty big risk and a risk they weren't worth taking because if it, if it didn't go well, it was probably their job. It might have been the viability of their company. It just wasn't a risk worth taking. Well, fast forward, they had that exact action forced upon them. There was no choice but to send everybody home. And so now we're in a new world. Every single company out there that was wondering what would happen if we did this, they now know. And now they know they have measurable data. They have measurable data on their productivity. They can see what's working. They can see where, where jobs are going. And so 
if all of a sudden we have an environment that allows these tech companies to curb hiring in the Bay Area and go hire these people elsewhere or have their Bay Area talent move elsewhere and have a better life experience, a better um, um, life for their families, then we might see that. And so that's the type of stuff that will have impact on, on, on um, real estate in the Bay Area. I was reading an article today, it was kind of interesting, um, that we haven't seen it happen. We haven't seen residential housing, we haven't seen residential decrease yet um, on the sale market at all. Um, especially in the suburbs, we've seen people moving from San Francisco uh, and we haven't seen the tech companies. A lot of the people in the Bay Area that are buying housing are the tech employees. The tech companies are the people that can pay these employees enough to actually be able to pay the high cost of housing. And so as long as we have robust tech and that ecosystem is working, then everything is going to stay inflated. Our exposure and our risk, whether it's on the commercial side or the residential side, is the viability of tech in our marketplace. If tech leaves, if, uh, it, whether by virtue of their businesses having trouble or by virtue of shipping employees elsewhere, then yeah, it's gonna have an impact on our market. Um, I think sadly you look at it and you look at kind of your Amazons of the world and walmart.com, you know, e-commerce is ripping, um, it's doing great. Um, and that's because everybody that used to be able to walk down the street and go buy something from their mom and pop retailer is now buying it on Amazon and it's coming in a box a few days later. So those companies have done well, they're still hiring, they're still growing, they're still um, leasing industrial space um, and potentially even office space, but um, it's certainly coming with a detriment, detrimental impact to our small business environment. Yeah, thank you, Jay. So, um, well, great uh, presentation, very informative, really appreciate and with a uh, very deep uh, analysis. So we have some, uh, questions that we'll like uh, to pick on your brain, including um, uh, Prop 13, the one that you mentioned about in your presentation, which is uh, related to the um, property tax. The current version is, uh, has a, it sets limits on uh, property tax increases not to exceed 2% per year and allowed both residential and commercial property to be reassessed only when it was sold. However, the new measure, which is going to be on the ballot in November, if passed, it will install a split row property tax where commercial properties with values over 3 million will be reassessed every three years at market value. So what do you think? I mean, um, how, would you, how would it impact the com uh, commercial real estate sales and leasing and, or even financing? Because uh, how you're going to underwrite it? Um, it would be a it would it would lead to a significant tax increase revenue, no doubt. Um, a number of the commercial buildings in San Francisco, we'll watch we'll, we'll watch them trade hands. Owners will routinely sell 49% interest in buildings and things like that as a way to recapitalize the asset, bring new money in. They're doing that because it doesn't trigger the reassessment under Prop 13. Um, there wasn't a change of owner official change of ownership when you have that. Um, the unfortunate part of it is it feels like it's directed at the wrong audience. Um, I think when you look at that, people look at, oh, we're going to go tax the rich, mighty landlord out there, um, and tax John Kilroy, and go tax Boston Properties, and go tax uh, TMG, and go tax Heinz, and go tax uh, uh, Tishman Spire. The reality is, is when they change the Prop 13, if they do that, that's not a tax that's going to be borne by those owners. That's going to get directly passed through to the tenants. Whether it's a triple net lease or a full service lease with a base year, taxes are passed through to tenants. So what that really is, is a tax on businesses, yet another tax on businesses operating in California, another tax on businesses operating in San Francisco. So will it, incre will it create significant revenue, tax revenue? Absolutely. Who's going to bear the burden of that? The same small businesses that just got absolutely devastated by COVID and your retail companies that have been suffering looting over the last several days, all the companies that are having all kinds of issues right now are the same ones that are going to bear the brunt of that tax, not your big rich landlord. They're going to still get the same net rent that they got before uh, they'll get it after. Um, so, um, you know, I really... I'd really be interested to know who they're targeting with their tax. If it's just go get any dollars you can, it'll be effective. 
if you're trying to tax the small business community and your business community, then it'll be an effective way to do that. But it is not a tax on your owners. That is not what it is. Yeah, according to measure, I think it's um, small businesses and uh, residential properties are exempted from this me uh, new measure. So yeah, you well, do it where you define it to, I think the property cutoff threshold was like $3 million or something like that, which is, you go look around San Francisco, there's not a lot of commercial properties that sell for less than $3 million. So, um, yeah. so there, okay, there is a component to that, but um, there, it, the harm is going to be the tenant, that because all those costs get passed through. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Ray. So another question, um, it's kind of hand in hand, uh, those uh, two questions. So one, ha one is like, let's say if you're a pro uh, commercial owner, commercial property owner, and you would like to sell um, your property this year. So what advice you would like to share with this potential seller? And when would be the best time to put it on the market, let's say this year, within this year? Yeah, um, that's a tough one and, and probably not one to answer generally. I think you, you really need to look at it as, um, site specific, asset specific, and also situation specific. Um, part of the problem with, with selling property right now is the capital markets, right? Your debt, your debt component. Um, what kind of loans can you get? Um, the debt markets are having trouble underwriting deals. Um, and so how fluid are the debt markets? How readily available is that capital? Um, and as a result of that, I think you're gonna see uh, have trouble uh, meeting buyer and seller. Um, if I was a seller of commercial property and I had a chance to exit at a premium number, I'd feel pretty comfortable doing it. Um, but I'm not sure where you're going to find the buyer that's willing to go buy at a premium right now. Um, I think your buyers are looking to be opportunistic. I think your sellers don't want to admit, aren't going to be in a hurry to admit to a new reality. And so the dynamic that we have that exists, and we have it on the leasing side as well as the sales side, is your bid-ask spread, right? Yeah. Our bid-ask spread right now is as wide as it could possibly be because you have supply side, hey, I would sell if I got my number, or I would rent my space if you pay my asking rent. The problem is we don't have the buyer community and we don't have the, the tenant demand community. Right. And we're not going to be able to have a buyer community until we see the tenant demand come and start setting those data points that allow the capital markets to have a marketplace to go and get comfortable that they can transact. And so as a result, like right now, it's just really hard to trade property. Um, um, you know, if in the industrial world, that's going to do a lot better than if you're trying to sell a hotel right now, right? Like we just saw a stat, zero investment dollars across the U.S. in the month of April going into the, the hotel industry. So um, later is probably better than sooner and not because markets are going to go up and down. It's just the absence of a marketplace right now that you can have buyers and sellers legitimately point to, to come, to come together and, and make an arm's length transaction. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, so let's wait uh, maybe, after, um, maybe after the summer and see how it goes, right? Yeah. So yeah, I, we have um, well, a couple of questions from our audience. Is, um, one is, um, it says, it asks like, from your, I think from your lease charge that had Uber. So the audience noticed that one piece location is for lease on Brandon. Is the one piece accelerator downsizing or leaving San Francisco? Which one on Brandon? Uh, it says it's uh, one piece. One piece location is for lease on Brandon. Oh, oh, oh! Maybe Brandon Square, the yeah. development pipeline. It might have been. Okay. Was that uh? Was that from Terry? Terry Bonner. Yes. Uh huh. I'm not sure. I know Uber does not have space on Brandon Street. Um, oh, no, uh, one is one piece. One piece location. Yeah. Or maybe we can um, table this question. Uh, yeah. If, if you're not, uh, um, Jay can answer uh, Carrie uh, afterwards. If you uh, if Carrie. Yeah. So let's move on to the next question. Like, um, do you anticipate net increase or decrease in office space demand going forward, given the need for social distancing? as well as more companies shifting, shifting to remote work? That, that, that is, that's a really good question and the, the unfortunate answer is too soon to tell. Um, um, 
the need for office space is, is going to be different. Um, that might be offset by how office space is built out and utilized. So we might have less people going into the office, but more space for those people to do. That could be a, that might, that might neutralize and, and, and kind of cancel out the impact. Um, so too soon to tell. And right now these companies are just trying to figure out how to get portions of their workplace back, uh, workforce back. Um, I think generally, yeah, you could see, um, um, less large high density sites and more kind of dispersed sites that allow you to have a distributed workforce that allow you to, to uh, go hire folks in more markets, having them work from home, home with the site that they can come in and touch down into when they need to, uh, which would lead to more sites that are generally smaller than your kind of big campuses. Uh, but it's really too soon to know if we're gonna, uh, what the net impact is gonna be on increase or decrease. Um, <clears throat> From, from our standpoint, we're watching the demand side and there's frankly no demand right now. And until we see some demand, um, we don't expect the marketplace to improve at all. Oh, I see. Okay. So I think biotech is uh, blooming right now. So do you think um, they will help uh, fill up some vacancies? And also on top of that, there are two IPO are coming this week and both are headquartered in South San Francisco. Yep. I think it's some good news. Yeah. Absolutely good news. Um, life science is doing great, um, obviously, um, and, a, and a focal point that's going to get some tailwind from COVID and all of, all, all of that. Um, the challenge with the life science is the type of product they need. Um, a lot of your buildings in San Francisco, especially all the stuff that was like built in the 70s, 80s, what have you, um, that product doesn't work for labs. You need a 14 foot plus slab to slab to, to build lab space. You need um, um, load infrastructure. You need base building infrastructure to allow you to have lab type uses in your buildings. Most of our product in San Francisco doesn't have that. Um, folks that are building now that have the benefit of building now, yeah, they can look at base building design. Maybe they build higher floor plates. Maybe they put in the infrastructure that allows them to go and and, and take their, their asset to a, uh, to a life science use, have optionality to do office or life science. But uh, frankly, a lot of the older product um, is not suitable for life science and the cost to uh, convert it uh, is either impossible. And if you have a high rise building with you know, 12 foot slabs, it's, it's not feasible. If you have uh, a tilt up building or something else where you could renovate it, your cost to do it is extreme. And so, um, you know, are you going to go and spend the five to six hundred dollars a square foot to go renovate your building to create a life science shell to go pursue life science companies? Maybe, but you're going to look at that on a situation specific basis. Uh, to the extent your ass the assets are uh, are able to have life science tendency, yeah, you're going to outperform your buildings that can't um, because there's still demand for for lab space and South San Francisco lab space is incredibly tight. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, good input. So a um, couple more questions is uh, we just pop up like um, one is about now that employees are working from home due to COVID-19. Companies just will evaluate and measure productivity and reduction in operating costs. Do you see any great impact on real estate in the Bay Area and housing market declining? Uh, I think there's potential. Potential for that, for sure. Um, and it's really if we do see a true mass exodus and uh, the tech worker leaving the Bay Area, um, but Bay Area is Bay, the Bay Area is an amazing place. It's a gateway to Asia. Um, it's uh, a center of innovation. You have Stanford and Cal and wonderful higher education institutions here, um, and we have some of the most innovative and, and dynamic companies in the world that are headquartered here. So as long as those companies continue to thrive and do well, the Bay Area is gonna do okay. But if Apple and Google start laying people off, yeah, our commercial rents are gonna get crushed, our housing's gonna get crushed, um, and we're not gonna be absolved from um, you know, greater kind of uh, macroeconomic forces. Um, we're still part of a, a global economy, and it's a more global economy than it was three years ago and five years ago and 10 years ago. And it's globalization is here to stay and is only going to um, increase as we go forward. And so we are, um, we are susceptible to macroeconomic forces. We have a little buffer in our bubble here. 
and that buffer and that bubble is 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 supported by big tech and to the extent we have any sort of change to big tech it's going to have a massive impact on us so um we will we will roll with big tech keep your eye on that nasdaq graph keep your eye on big tech um and as long as they're doing okay we'll be okay um if we see big tech starting to turn and they're not doing an m a and they're laying off people um yeah that's it that, I, that, that's a run don't walk situation i know i think well so far so good cross our fingers thank <laughs> you uh, jay so um next question so um since people are not driving to san francisco and other cities how is it impacting parking facilities also is impact in future do you think it will be like i think yeah, I, guess, I don't think there's that many people going 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 okay. going to the city right now going to work um we did talk about we did we, we have talked about the whole public transportation issue and social distancing it's virtually impossible so will, will more people drive um potentially right now i don't think there's enough demand or people going into the city to do that i used to drive into the city i had a parking lease at a garage in the city i canceled it in in april um you know if and when i go back yeah i'm gonna go get a parking space again and we'll see where it is on on the whole kind of supply and demand side but that's all all you have on the parking is another supply and demand environment uh people that can park are going to charge as much as they can for it and that's going to be a function of how many people need to park there and we'll see what happens but that's not an issue yet san francisco doesn't want people driving they've gone away from uh being car friendly um between you know shutting down market street reducing to two lanes on van s i mean san francisco has been pretty clear that they want uh, uh less car traffic and more public tra transportation infrastructure um i do think the the uh, the central subway connecting the train up to Market Street and through Chinatown is going to be huge, uh, just for connectivity to the South Bay and really linking rail from the South Bay to BART by virtue of of a simple transfer. Um, um, that's a significant advancement, and uh, when that opens up, but again, uh, you know we've got to get through this whole social distancing thing and. Um, whether that's vaccine oriented or herd immunization or whatever it's going to be, um, you know, it's hard to kind of bifurcate between where we are right now and nobody's going to work. And then what happens when there's a vaccine? Is it just flip a switch and everyone goes back to normal? Uh, I don't think the new normal is going to be what the old normal was. I think, I think people are changing the way they work, behavioral change. Everyone on this call, me personally, I've changed the way I worked over the last three months. The way I work in the future is going to be different. I will work from home more. Um, I will look at my office space differently than I looked at it before. And so um, I don't think anyone um, is expecting it to just flip a switch and be like it was six months ago. Um, so we'll see. And I don't see any near time, any, any real near term return to normalcy. We haven't heard, heard anybody talk about going back. Um, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, all these companies have said not till the end of the year at the earliest. Yeah. Um, and so that's seven months away. That's a lot more time for behavior to change and get accustomed to your, accustomed to your new routine. And um, we'll just have to see. Um, yeah. We'll just have to see. Yeah, I think people are, uh, we all like to, to maintain some kind of social life. Social, so, yeah, we're social people. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've been like, oh, that's uh, that's uh, that's um, uh, uh, it, it, it's a miss so, uh, so far. So uh, there's one um, one um, recommendation or or, or, or or thoughts that I would like to share with you uh, with everyone through uh, a banker who is uh, our audience today. You say that well for any owner user purchases that close by September 27th, 2020, and if it's SBA financing. Borrower gets six months of free payments from SBA. 25 years fixed currently in the low 3% range. I think it's pretty good, good news. So Jay, before I let you go, I have one more question. Um, probably you have your crystal ball hiding behind your door somewhere. <laughs> I would like to have you share your, 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 um, your expectation or your projection, when will you expect to see the commercial sales and leasing markets coming back? Uh, I think probably later this year. We'll start, we'll see a gradual increase in activity um, for sure. We're already starting to see it. 
when when shelter in place started in March, like the music stopped and it was literally pencils down across the board, period, zero exceptions. Um, since then, uh, we've started to see some companies. We have some clients, there's some winners out there. There's actually some, peop, some companies that have benefited quite a bit um, from, from uh, what's happened here, Zoom. We're on Zoom platform right now. You know, if you polled the audience on how many people use Zoom every day uh, six months ago, compared to now, it's, it's a wildly different number. And so, um, Companies that have done well, uh, ServiceNow, um, it's a workforce platform that's, that's cloud enabled in a virtual work environment. Um, they're doing great. Um, so you're seeing some companies that are doing okay, uh, still now proceeding with transactions. And so we've seen uh, the companies that are doing well start to kind of keep going. Um, we've seen some subleases come to market. We've seen people start coming to want to try to tour spaces so that we're starting to just have the early stages of the thaw. Um, we froze up, we paralyzed, and nothing happened for a good two months. And just now, over the last few weeks, we're just starting to see the ice start to break a little bit, thaw out, and start to see some movement. And I think that's what we'll see. It's not going to be light switch goes on, everyone's going to start transacting like crazy again. We're going to see a few data points, and then we're going to start to be able to point to it. And then once we have a data point, we can now point to that to go try to get our next data point. And then there'll be two data points to go get our third data point. And as we start having more transactions happen, we start to develop a marketplace. And once we actually have a marketplace develop, um, that's when we'll start seeing transaction velocity pick up again. The, the best news about uh, now compared to call it our last downturn or the capital markets crisis is <laughs> everyone kind of got caught with their pants down in the real estate world. In, in the last one. Um, if you weren't well capitalized, you were in a lot of trouble and the credit markets literally froze. Um, this time around, um, we saw the Fed Act much quicker. Um, we saw the government step in and start buying assets where there wasn't liquidity. Um, and so we've seen this, this support come from our government um, in volumes and speed that we've never seen before. Um, that was very, very helpful for, for our environment and for the capital markets. We started to see a, a couple cracks. There are a couple fractures. The CMBS market really got a little hairy there for a minute. Um, and so um, we need the capital markets performing for the buy-sell to happen. In order for the capital markets to perform, they need to see leasing data points. So this all comes back to the demand, and we need to see tenants and, and companies out there willing to sign new leases and set the market so the rest of the marketplace can, can, can start going. And I think that'll, that'll continuously pick up steam as we proceed. The thing that's really scary is if there was a big second wave and we all go back to normal and we start getting back to work and all of a sudden it's shut down, shelter in place, and we're all sent back home for another three months, that might spook some people uh, even more so than, than kind of the shock to the system that we had in March. And that's, that's a little bit scary. Um, hopefully we buy enough time where we can start developing vaccines or we have an environment where we're not uh, exposing our healthcare systems to overload. And so we can work through this in a more kind of rational environment than literally shutting down our entire economy for a multiple month period. Um, and so we just need we just need some transactions to start and it's starting, it's starting to happen. Um, and so I think we'll gradually see it uh, continue to increase as we progress. And, um, you know, I don't think we'll be doing the leasing volumes and sale volumes that we saw over the last five years this year, but, you know, hopefully we can, um, you know, in the next 24 to 36 months, um, you know, I think industrial is going to be your strongest performing sector, um, you know, retail and, and hotels, uh, pretty rough. I'd, I'd want to be an industrial and, and multifamily. People are always going to need a place to live. Um, so that, those are the sectors that I think will, will perform. I think with a lot of the issues that uh, the current administration is having with, uh, with China and, and, and other countries, it's, it's a really relatively combative environment. Um, I think you'll see a lot of companies uh, bring manufacturing and distribution and that sort of stuff back to the U.S., which will help the, the national industrial markets um, to just take some of that, that international risk and exposure that they otherwise carry um, off the table. Um, it'll come at a premium. It's more expensive to do it here. That's why they stopped doing it here in the first place. Um, 
But if you've got political risk and existential risk and those sorts of things, um, a slight cost premium to preserve your operations is, is well, worth, well worth it. And that's why um, I think we're seeing a real return uh, on the industrial side out here, uh, oh. especially the bigger block stuff. Good news. Wow. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Great uh, presentation. And again, thank you so much for you um, being such a great uh, panelist and uh, uh, provide all this uh, information, um, data, and trends, and your insight. And, um, and also, thank you all the audience as well. And I pass it on to uh, Yanni to wrap up this uh, webinar. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Jay, for your presentation. Uh, it's very informative, I would say. Um, thank you so much uh, for Angela's uh, um, moderation. So due to the time and the patient, we may be uh, unable to answer all the questions that you have. Uh, but we will share uh, Jay's contact uh, on, on our website later on. And also, please look out for the email. Uh, Look out for the email that we will send tomorrow, which you can uh, re-watch uh, today's webinar recordings. And if you have any questions uh, to our speaker, uh, please feel free to uh, let us know. You can always send, uh, send us an email uh, or you can visit our website to do so. So I, before we close today's webinar, I would just want to make a quick announcement on uh, an upcoming webinar next week. So for next week, we will be hosting a webinar in partnership uh, with uh, Mano Spark and also the Wayne Central for the, uh, for the webinar titled, The New Normal, Work From Home, Work Together From Anywhere. So in this webinar, uh, we will be discussing um, how we can establish a, work, a working from home program. And if you don't want to miss, uh, we will have a free giveaway. So uh, stay tuned for more information. And thank you very much for today's participation. And thank you again, our panelists. So uh, please stay safe and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Sean. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Angela. Right. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.